Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Colorado Main Street webinar presentation on appropriate infill for historic Main Street dis districts. My name is Gail Langley and I'm the state coordinator for the DOLA Colorado Main Street program. And I'd like to introduce our speaker and presenter for today, um, Mr. Larry Lucas. Larry is a registered architect and a full-time staff member of the Colorado Main Street program. His role is to provide education, advocacy, and technical assistance to all of our Main Street communities. We are very fortunate to have Larry as a full-time staff member, and I'd like to give some recognition to History Colorado for a partial funding of his um, ability to be as a resource on our Main Street team. So with that, I will just hand it over to Larry. Um, you guys are all in muted mode. But if you have questions throughout the webinar, please type them in. Uh, we can either handle those as we go or wait till the end. We'll kind of take a look at what your questions are. And Larry, take it from there. I'll let you know if some folks are typing in some inquiries. Thanks, Gail. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us around the lunch hour. Um, as Gail mentioned, um, the best thing for questions during this presentation, if you have them, is just to type them in the chat box on the bottom right of your control panel. And Gail can um, uh, bring those up as we get between, from section to section. So let's move, let's move ahead and learn about infill today. My contact information. I've been with the Main Street program in Colorado for about six months now. And before that, um, for a time I was in Oklahoma for six and a half years. And so I've seen a lot of different kinds of infill and I have a little bit of a different approach that I wanna share with you guys. Um, we're gonna start off talking about uh, what towns originally were like, um, because that does inform what our infill is today. And then we're gonna dig into different kinds of examples of infill, talk about how we can work with our local governments um, to implement good ideas. And then we'll, of course, be taking questions throughout, but if you have any others, we'll have some time at the end for that too. So an important principle um, to think about when we're working with infill construction is that we always have to look back so that we can move ahead. And the idea of that is very fundamental to historic preservation. Um, if we're looking back, we're always gonna uh, be reminiscent of the past. And that's super important because those are the things that make our communities unique or those heritage assets. Your Main Street District is essentially the boundary of the area that we need to be, be talking about today. So we won't be going too far out that, about, outside of that. Um, so this is my hometown, uh, Poto, Oklahoma. And this was around the turn of the century. And this shows some of the original town site um, um, the commercial district that formed actually after some of the original housing. There was a railroad switch there and it led to this. And this is where people came to do commerce and trade. And you guys know this story too. Around it, we had settlement. Um, these pictures were taken about the same time. The one in the top right was in the 20s. Um, uh, the one at the, in the center is a little bit sooner. That's people coming to town. But just know that there was this central neighborhood that was walkable and connected and people um, did business in downtown. And there was also some mining in the area. So this train would take people up to the mines every day. This is uh, called the Sanborn map. And you guys are probably familiar with this, many of you. Um, your community probably has these. Um, not every town would, but most did. And they were for fire insurance purposes. And they actually identified the types of buildings and the development of the day uh, by construction type, um, uh, as, as well as just really labeling what it was, how tall it was, they're very informative. This one was done in 1925. And then here's a photo. I, the thing that I like about using the Sanborn maps as kind of an initial level of study when thinking about infill development and what to do with the uh, infill site is that it gives you this kind of 4D view of that period in time. Uh, you can look back and you can see a photo and then you can reference it like I've done here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but towards the bottom where it says Main Street upside down, that is actually where the photo is taken from. So it's cool to be able to see the past at the same time overlaid with a plan 
And again, if you if you dig these out for your own town, you'll be able to see that um, there's a lot of details about each property, just with some really interesting uh, nomenclature, uh, letters and symbols and colors. You can find those typically at your library, um, uh, town archives. Also, um, the Library of Congress has quite a few of them online. So that's a cool resource. This is another cool resource. Um, when you're thinking about the past, there's a lot of, of technology that we no longer have. Uh, you can think of it as archaic stuff because, you know, like electrical wiring, it's a lot better nowadays, a lot safer. But it's important to know about some of these things. And um, I want to point your attention at the same time to the download section or the attachments on the webinar cluster. I have five key resources. This is one of them um, that you can download to take with you today. So anytime you see key resource, just know that that is a download for you. You should check this out if you haven't. It's, an, it's really a tremendous resource and I know they're gonna continue adding to it over time, but it'll help you take that look back too. Some of the things that you find is uh, like this uh, a catalog of uh, stores and, and flat buildings and uh, just the classic Main Street building, and it, and it may show how a shopkeeper could live upstairs and have a store downstairs. And it's neat that that was available as kind of a design. And it's also cool that it was such a simple uh, set of drawings there. I'm sure it was a little bit more uh, detailed if you ordered the set. Not really sure, but the whole catalog only cost a dollar, so who knows? Hey, Larry. Yes. I'm getting some questions in saying people are not they're not able to see past the initial slide. Hmm. That's not good. Well, I'll just run back to the beginning then and we'll just zip through this again real quick. I don't know what happened there. Sorry, everyone. So here's the initial slide again. And what we've walked through essentially, is everyone you see in this scale? No, I'm not either. You're not seeing this. Okay, um, can you see? So can you see my screen right now? No, it's still the very first slide. The one that has our logo? Yes. Oh, uh, something's, I think it's because you're logged in. And I'm getting that from other communities. Let me do this again. It's all right. Is it shared? How about now? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. This is my first go at this. Um, let's go back real quick. And I'll make this available on uh, to you guys afterwards too. I'll email you a copy of this presentation. My apology. Um, right. It will also be uploaded to our website. Yeah, let me get caught up now because we're okay. I don't want to get us short on time. So here, here again is kind of the list of things we're going to run through. We we haven't really missed a lot of the cool examples yet. The Main Street District is what the area we're going to look at. You had a historic heart to your community, a center of trade and commerce, and around that was a neighborhood of, uh, of residences, typically, typically, and and some type of industry. Um, that that is detailed in Sanborn maps that you can locate at your local library, museum, archives, and also online. Library of Congress has a portal for this. And then um, here's a picture of my own hometown paired with a Sanborn map that actually is pretty neat when you start doing this level of, of research where you can actually look from a certain point of view and 
people kind of kind of examine things in in more of a three dimensional or four dimensional time frame because the Sanborn map has so much detail about a building, even in just the plan view. And here's that first key resource, and hopefully you guys will find that on your downloads. Um, this is just a PDF simply to give you the link because uh, there was really no way to give you the whole book or anything. There's thousands and thousands of catalogs uh, for house plans and products. And here's those typical Main Street building details. Um, just pretty cool that you get this whole book of designs for a dollar. Okay, so what is infill? So I think it's just as important to consider what's missing as what is there when you're considering the picture. And again, you're always looking back, you're thinking about what was there potentially. And you got to know that stuff whenever you're going to make decisions about your downtown because it's the most important part of town. So let's let's just think through quickly some quick quick thoughts that you want to consider vacant and underutilized space before new construction. Um, you want to be authentic to the place and compatible and complementary to everything around. And also, you want your infill to be interactive and engaging. I think it's always been that way, but that means a little different. Uh, has a different definition today than it used to potentially. Uh, here's a picture, uh, it's actually me and the Elizabeth Main Street Board. And we went on a tour recently to examine infill construction in four communities uh, around the Denver Metro, but smaller Main Street type districts. And um, we looked for good and bad examples and you're gonna see some of those through the slideshow. Now let's take a different point of view when thinking about infill than many of you probably came expecting. You maybe came expecting to hear about buildings purely, like you're going to infill a building. Well, I actually think it's a lot broader than that. I've talked with some colleagues and have expanded my thinking, and it's exciting to think of infill as it's really an opportunity in all kinds of realms. The first one um, that we need to think about um, infill, especially when we start referring to things like tactical urbanism and lighter, quicker, cheaper projects like Main Street is advocating is the streetscape and sidewalk areas, the areas that are public. We can actually create areas that are like really sticky is a word I like to think of because you kind of want to stick around for a while. And an idea that, that I've heard before that I really like is that towns could encourage the funding of something like a vibrancy grant, which maybe would be hey, if anybody needs a new sign this year for their business, we're gonna fund this block and we're gonna pay up to $500 matching or something like that. Or you could go district wide or, uh, or street by street and do um, certain types of catchy elements, things that catch your attention, colorful things, interactive games, art, flowers. I know a lot of you guys are doing that, but if you take more of a strategic approach and actually maybe pair that with some of your facade funding, or allow it to filter both ways, then you could do some interesting things, especially if you say a whole new, a whole block on both sides of the street got new signs in a year, or had the opportunity to if they needed it. it can really cause a big, big impact quickly. Here's some of those things that, you know, you may think of it as just ricky ticky things, but it's really not. These are things that, um, make a district more attractive. Some of the things are iconic even, like the horse in front of the FM Light building in Steamboat Springs. It's, it's, that's an iconic thing. Little kids take their picture there all the time. Um, you know, and it can be fun and you can have whimsy. And these things are part of infill design. There are things also that maybe um, uh, you consider infill like the, this trash can on the top left, but that leave you very, um, you're, you're sort of stuck with what you ended up with. So you better make sure that you really want to have something that's very rigid when you're doing infill in the public way. Um, also consider that maybe a, a tactic you could think about would be something a little bit lighter that you could uh, change and, and be a little bit more nimble um, to accomplish your goals, but still not really change the structure of the public way. One particular example I really liked when we were in Louisville, Colorado, was their patio program, and it's subsidized by the city. They actually built these units, modular units. They're, I think they're 12 feet long, um, and they built these to actually serve as an expansion to warehouse, to a restaurant seating during the summer um, or during the nicer weather times. And then they take them up in the winter to allow for that seasonal maintenance and cleaning and, and just to take care of them. But it really has caused a big impact, and it's something that the city, they, I think they, 
uh, I think they lease them for a fee of around $1,000 for a season per unit. Um, and then there's this revocable easement that they grant to the business. And it's just a really neat thing. It actually, you would be surprised how many of these are along one street and how busy they get too. Also, when you're thinking about the public way and infilling that space um, to create a more usable experience, you want to think about staging things if possible or if you need to. You may not arrive at this solution at the bottom in one foul swoop. And sometimes if you try to do that, you have a lot of problems. So first you might paint your site, your crosswalks, and you may do corner bump outs. Um, but just know that trying to fix everything all at once sometimes is not the right approach. And sometimes being a little more tactical and getting your hands dirty and doing a couple of uh, better block type projects um, to, to kind of see some change in advance may be better when you're thinking about doing this work. Second key resource is this uh, from our, from, we had, this is available on our website as well. Um, and actually as a toolkit, so more than you'll even find on the download, but the book is available on download there for you. The next area of infill I'd like you to consider is alleys, and it's actually one of my favorites. Um, things about alleys that you can do, like this is just a very typical alley uh, in both these cases. Um, the one above is more of kind of a, an area between two buildings that's not really an alley, it's just more of a place to store stuff but think how cool these places could be with the right types of improvements you do some lighting um, you uh, maybe have some rear entrances and some signage and you could do some things that really make it an attractive and inviting area and you could really further kind of the economic impact of your district this these are some uh, some backs of buildings and in-betweens of buildings um, in Louisville on the left um, very nice uh, area for uh, to sit and uh, I think they have a bar there at night and there's actually a I don't have a picture but a large bicycle parking lot which is kind of cool on this building. Um, you know murals are always good and gosh look what you can do with hanging some lights you can create kind of a through uh, way that maybe before didn't seem so safe or didn't seem like you really should go there but if you point people in that direction and give them some alternate ideas and some choices that's a good thing to do and it can just expand the impact of your district. This is uh, Antler Alley in Woodland Park. Uh, we helped them with a little design sketch for some uh, alterations to the pavement to make it a little safer lately, but it, they've been adding archways. You can't see it on the picture to the right, but at the end of that picture, they've, they've constructed this antler arch that you're seeing them building at the bottom left. It's really cool. It frames Pikes Peak as you walk through there. So it's, you know, these kinds of spaces um, further enhance your interpretation of the historic district. And uh, if you didn't do this kind of work, then you wouldn't have, um, uh, you just essentially would have something kind of barren and ugly. Back of the alley top left, that is actually an enclosed dining area where they've expanded it, but it opens up like an operable wall and they have their food trucks sitting there. So um, they've in increased their seating to kind of maximize their, their capacity there. Same thing in the picture top top center. Um, so that they have kind of, and, and these areas are supposed to be a little bit grungy. They're a little bit different. They have a, uh, a little bit of a grittiness to them that makes them cool. I mean, they're alleys. So you can also dress them up like the ones to the right. Um, and that's totally fine. These are really more of areas between buildings, which I don't think of as much as alleys but sort of because they act as an alley. They act as a way to move between places. Uh, bottom left is a small bathroom that a, a city government constructed. Uh, this one's in Texas. And um, that's a neat infill project. It's always good to have a bathroom downtown if there isn't one. Next key resource where you're gonna get a lot more good links in the back of it um, is this uh, downtown Bozeman Alley sketchbook. It's, it's a fairly brief resource. I just really like it. it. has some nice examples and they've done a lot of good work in their alleys. So plazas and pocket parks, these are kind of something that um, we might touch on a little bit later if we have time, but just know that there are spaces that 
um, can really cause great engagement for the community, like a well-placed splash pad is wonderful. But I just want you to remember to always consider the value of that property and think about if it's really the best use for it. And if it's worth the cost to upkeep it, like the one on the bottom right from Oklahoma, um, it, there may not be quite as much function there as the one on the left, which also functions as the farmer's market where the splash pad is. Um, and, and I just wonder, it, it does beautify the downtown, but in terms of high impact, I, I would let you guys weigh that with your design committees and your boards to decide, and your, and your town governments to decide really if that's the right move to make. It, it's certainly better than it being vacant like it was. So moving into vacant and underutilized spaces, there's all kinds of things. This, this is a little bit funky, but these are both not really buildings. If you look at the roof deck on Waterloo, and if you look at the uh, two-story dining area that's like a full metal freestanding structure to the top left, they're not really buildings, and they may not really fit with your preservation ethic. And that's something that you guys are going to have to decide, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit, developing your design um, standards and, and guidelines. But I just want to throw these out there. Um, some of these ideas will fit because of, say the, I don't know what happened to the building on the bottom right. Potentially it, it suffered a fire or something. So they're kind of uh, making uh, lemonade here. I don't know, but it turned out to be kind of a cool, interesting and unique thing. And so, you know, again, weigh these opportunities and make the right decision for your community. And and also just to incentivize business as well, but keeping an eye towards preservation, obviously. And I'm gonna give you some tools in a minute for design guidelines to work through that. This is an interesting project. So it, this is actually a firehouse in Collinsville, Oklahoma that burned. So I don't know how much, I don't know what happened there, but um, it, it's the bottom left picture after the fire. And then it was rehabbed completely into their city hall. And it's absolutely gorgeous inside. Um, uh, the doors are fixed there on the end. And they still have the fire pole inside the city council chambers, which is right off behind those doors. I'm, I, so this is a little different. So you might think, well, that's adaptive reuse. Well, yeah, but it's also infilling a dead space. So I'm just trying to, I, wanna, I want everyone to take a bigger picture about infill and what that really means. There, we know you have vacant buildings in your town. So wouldn't that be the right thing to put something in first? Here's another property that I believe either suffered a fire or a collapse. I found the photos online and I just love it. Um, they stabilized the front facade of this theater and they created a really beautiful park inside. Um, you know, wouldn't it have been neat to build the theater back? Sure, but sometimes budgets and everything come into play. They've at least preserved the front facade so that it could be used at a later date for a structure, which I think is just right behind rebuilding the building. I mean, that is pretty awesome. And then here's another one. Sometimes you have buildings you don't even know you have, and they're just hiding behind uh, metal slip covers from the 60s and 70s. And, and uh, you take them off and you rediscover really the historic character of your downtown. And we all have buildings that are covered with slip covers. Some are good slip covers from the built in the 50s and the 60s, and some are cover ups. And um, you have the opportunity when you take off these slip covers to infill the second floor, second and third floors again um, with residences and offices and, and you name it, uh, maker spaces. Um, gives you the opportunity to really utilize your assets and, and keep things tight and compact, uh, which is how these districts were originally engineered to work. Those kind of um, homes can, can look really, uh, pretty first rate. Uh, I've been in some lofts and I've, 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 here's a few pictures from some of my favorites that were just really well done, just located right downtown, right on the main street or right off of a main street. Another thing to consider is the space in front of an old car dealership or a auto tire shop or something that has, is part of your district and maybe needs some beautification and also maybe needs a use so that you can maintain that street wall of buildings, the, the line of the front of the buildings and the setbacks and keep those, um, uh, keep the eye moving down the street from place to place and keep people walking. 
this is a great use of, 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 a, of a parking lot. And then on the corner, just a green space, but probably where a building had been, where somebody has a small flower stand. And I, you know, these are the kinds of things that you want to encourage, um, the temporary uses um, and things like that, when you have the space to let. So finally, right, like here's, you know, a lot of you guys are like, okay, finally, some new buildings. Well, I think it's really just part of it all. I think it's really sort of a last result, and it's actually probably the most difficult thing to do. So that's why I didn't lead off with that. Um, still, there are good ways and bad ways to do this. Um, now, again, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not one to really point a finger and tell people they've done something, um, you know, adverse, but always pay careful attention to history and think about um, your design standards whenever you're working with older buildings. You know, is it appropriate to build higher on top of an existing two-story brick building? Well, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's, that's really up to you. Even if there's a setback, sometimes it doesn't quite look right, or, you know, you don't maybe want to attach and, you know, without some kind of differentiation or a setback to a, a building with a metal structure. And, you know, gosh, wouldn't, you know, sometimes the city has its own ideas and, and that's okay, uh, for what works on, in a cornerstone lot downtown. But, um, that's really for you guys to decide and for your individual preservation ethics to develop and development guidelines. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. Here's something that's um, kind of in between, I would say. It's uh, scaled very well. It has the same rhythm that you might find. Um, there's, there's a lot of different materials going on and there. You know, it's easy to nitpick a lot of things, but I think the intent in this design is good because you have upper floor. It looks like you have mixed use, which is what you're wanting to shoot for um, above a single story building, obviously. Of course, if your town has mostly single story buildings, you probably want to stick with that uh, in that context and, and not build two stories unless you have really a need for it. And then there are other ways to make it work stylistically um, and, uh, so that it fits. That, that particular building was one block off of um, off of Main Street. This is actually another key resource. Um, it's, it's a sheet that really gives you kind of the three-part design of a, a classic Main Street building. Uh, your lower level storefront, your upper floor, and then your cornice level. And um, you can download this and, and it, most Main Street properties would follow this this rhythm. If it doesn't have the upper floor, it would still have the storefront and the cornice level. Um, there's obviously a lot more in details to find, but uh, you should have historic photos. And that's always my first point of reference whenever I'm trying to help somebody rehabilitate a storefront that's either missing or lost or damaged, or even upper floor windows or brick details. You kind of want to look there first, look back to move ahead. That's just kind of my mantra. Here's some examples of new construction that seemingly fit. Um, you know, are the materials similar to what's being used downtown? Is the scale similar? Um, are some of the is the level of detail similar and the level of perceived quality similar? Uh, if you can say yes to most or all of those, um, you're getting there for sure. Also, you want to make sure that things like the tops and bottoms of your windows may align. Uh, you want to look for those clues, though, by just taking a step back and looking at your district overall. Well, let's talk a little bit further about how do we know when we're doing things the right way, and then how can we guide that a little bit? Uh, as a strategy, uh, it's incredibly important to uh, develops a historic preservation ethic. And in Colorado, there's a certified local government program. And that's actually one of the key documents that you can download too. There's a guidebook there that talks in great detail about everything from getting your district um, uh, designated, um, uh, setting boundaries, and then actually establishing design guidelines, forming a commission. Um, and and that, that document I think is super key 
And if you haven't seen it before, it's definitely worth downloading and a read. Next thing that I think maybe would help would be doing, uh, making sure that you have a good building and business inventory so that you can examine the vacancy rates and the areas that could use infill, whether or not it's a vacant lot or it's maybe a second floor that's underutilized or, or, or actually not used at all because it's not able to be used. It's no, no modern electric or heating and cooling, which happens a lot. Um, so that gives you an ability to set priorities. And that's what I mean down in the next level with like space utilization modeling. I think that's just kind of, that was my best way of saying that you would look at all the different spaces and set priorities based on impact. Um, of course, all this goes along with your city's comprehensive planning and also obviously you want to have mixed use zoning so that you can actually and, and it's funny that a lot of communities haven't really done that even though they're kind of doing it you might want to formalize that so that you can establish what it is that you will and will not allow uh, market analysis is something that we can help with uh, through our for our, our communities um, there, we actually have a range of, of things that we're can provide or, or if we don't know can't do it then we know who can the next, the last thing you probably would want to start looking at once you have some of the bones and the foundation in place with your uh, city's zoning codes and ordinances. Is you might want to set up some incentive programs for the older and let that guide both um, planning um, and also some of those some of the final uh, the little spark plug improvements that can happen like the vibrancy grants and facade grant programs and things like that um, just as a side note um, if you're a clg community you qualify for a lot of uh, planning dollars uh, for historic preservation plans and and things like that for your downtown so that's something really not to overlook and there's a lot of value to be found in that program not only for the preservation ethic it helps foster but also for some of the resources that you can gain. Here's a, a picture of that guide that's available for download. So what can you do as a local, uh, you know, a community member? Um, one of the first things you can do is just kind of be a super sleuth, be observant and see what you have available downtown. You can, um, you know, work with the design committee to, to form a historic photo book. You can actually document the kinds of uh, trees that work well for shade and that grow without water in your community. You can think about the materials that were historically there and why they were there and, you know, why that was important. Um, even thinking about original paint colors of buildings, which involves some level of analysis. Sometimes it's just a pocket knife, but um, sometimes you can you can do some pretty fancy paint analysis that you can have sent off and they can tell you exactly what color things were like every layer. Uh, and that's pretty cool. Um, another side note is the State Historic Fund will offer um, historic structural assessments of properties. And that's something you can apply for. And I'm sorry I didn't put that link up, but it's essentially through History Colorado. And if you have a property that um, it's either publicly or owned publicly or through a nonprofit, it, it, it could qualify for sure uh, for additional monies too. But I think in any case, you can, you can apply for historic structural analysis, historic structure analysis. And it's a neat grant to get because you can learn so much about an old building that you didn't know, you know, including things like every color it's been painted on the storefront or the front door. Um, and, and, you know, how good a shape the structure is in and really kind of an inside out view of the whole thing to give you a clear picture of what you can do with a property uh, or what it's going to need before you can really take any steps forward. Um, so I, I encourage you guys to check that website out. Are we, how are we doing on any questions, Gail? Am I talking too fast? I have one that came in right at the beginning. Um, I wasn't sure if you wanted to keep going or if you wanted me to interrupt. Um, I can read it off to you and you can figure out if this is a good time. But sure. Libby Fay, she's a, a Bona Vista trustee, is specifically asked uh, about their Main Street Group and Historic Preservation Commission are drafting some historical guidelines 
and she wanted to know if you had any specific recommendations to help them. You bet, uh, Libby Fay. That uh, that's actually coming up here in just a second. Um, there we go. Next slide. Um, <laughs> so there are there are towns that we can actually share some of their design guidelines directly with you. Um, it's one of those things that it's almost better not to reinvent the wheel uh, because there are so many different examples, and you can cater these to your community. So for for uh, Buena Vista, we can definitely find something that's compatible. Just reach out to me later and I'd be glad to work with you, get you some, some examples or any of you guys. Here's some kind of high level ideas surrounding design guidelines and that, you know, you, you want to provide kind of a, explain the context, obviously at the beginning, what your town and community um, was like, what it's, and you know, and, and what that means. What, what that heritage is and then set the criteria of like well, and here's really our stance on historic preservation and you know that needs to be unwavering that needs to be like here's what we want and i know um in bv there's been some pressure from outside development to do things that are a little bit more modern and you know that's something you can control through regulation having good design guidelines and, um, and making those enforced for the historic district. So you essentially, the design guidelines would, would um, work for whatever zone you apply them to. So you could essentially set up an overlay zone, a historic district zone or something like that, or central business district, whatever you would want to call it for your town. And then the design guidelines would um, work for that zone only. And so that actually helps it to be passed through as well. Design guidelines shouldn't be something that the whole community needs to worry about unless they're in a historic district that, that ha, you know, it's that it's meaningful, you preserve it. So that approach, it, it works really well. Um, like I said, I'd be glad to work with any of you guys on uh, figuring out a strategy to implement that and even finding good examples and, and even helping you review some of those some of your documents to, to see if we're on the right track. And I know History Colorado is in the same boat too. Um, so a couple more things. It's good to use non-technical language, obviously, when you're writing these. And you want to use pictures. You want to use like show show yes and no's. So this is a good example. And it's best if you have these examples locally, even from you know from the past or even today. You know, we're not looking for this anymore. Take a picture of it put it in there, say this isn't, we don't use stucco on Main Street or whatever your example is, have a picture of it and say, nope. And then say, these are the, these are the kinds of materials that, that we would like. And in any case, you still want to use these really as an, as a way to get people pointed in the right direction and to set expectations. But in the end, your commission, your historic preservation commission should, if they're working um, and reviewing, uh, uh, projects for for to, to make sure that they, they cut the mustard then you should then you should have the ultimate determination and I, I would not want to give that away and let the design guidelines have so much information that they just that there's really no decision to be made because then you end up with some things that aren't quite right especially on rehabilitation work where you're um good example um uh, the town of lake city i think has multiple kinds of, uh, of of roofing allowed because you know there's fire danger in there in the mountains and so metal roofs have kind of historically been done there but today's metal roofs don't look like yesterday's metal roofs so just saying metal roofs in your design guidelines as is something that that may be um, allowed is kind of given some it's kind of misleading a little bit so maybe it'd be better sometimes to say on a case-by-case -case basis with prior approval, you know, and specific materials, um, specifications submitted, then metal roofs may be allowed. You know, so, so you kind of have to, you're, you want your design guidelines to fit your community and your needs, but you don't want them to be so rigid or so thick that no one can interpret them or that it's even difficult for the commission. Number one, though, is it's most important to make sure that they are uh, that everything is directed from the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, 
which is quite flexible actually, and it's more of a philosophy. And again, it leaves it a little bit more open for debate and interpretation, but that's where your commission really needs training to understand how to say something is historically appropriate or not. Um, finally, I would say that uh, if you have design guidelines and it's for like say your Main Street district boundary, which is a real easy way to set up a historic district boundary, just say it's the Main Street district because then it could shift and change with that district if it needed to. Um, that you, you would say, if you want the facade grant money, then you have to submit a plan and it has to meet our design guidelines, you know, just point blank, it's simple. And it's a good way to get good work done and to incentivize good work. So I, I think they're ne necessary, but the level of detail is something that uh, I would say keep it appropriate. Appropriate. Don't get too don't get too too thick with the book. That raises a good question here. Um, this document, and I'm sorry I did not attach this, but it's called. If you guys want to Google it. I think you can find it, and if you can't, um, we might be able to send this out with the presentation, but it's called Keeping Up Appearances. And I'm just gonna show you, this is the first page on infill construction. This is the second page, and that's it. So this is the National Main Street Center that was produced in 1995. They no longer produce it. Um, really cool document, but it actually leads you through the whole story of downtown design in a very generic way but also in a way that I think most people can understand. It's kind of like, do this, not this. And um, we'll, we'll try to find a way to connect, to um, attach this, but and it, hopefully you can find it. It's called Keeping Up Appearances. And if you'd like, I can email, if you just contact me, I could get you a copy too. Um, another, just a fast way when you're thinking about buildings again is this acronym FRESH. Uh, a, a Main Street architect in Georgia, actually he's a, he's a landscape architect, but he, he came up with this and I really like it. And it's just, just think of FRESH when you're looking at a building to see if it fits. And you know, look, think about footprint and foundation first. Like what does that look like in the setbacks? The R is the roof shape. Is it a flat roof or a gabled roof? A lot of downtowns in the east and actually some in Colorado have um, uh, uh, gabled roofs to keep, you know, shed snow. And, um, and also because they were probably uh, older than, you know, early 1900s and we had a lot of masonry and beginning steel construction and longer span wood. But, okay, so E is envelope. So the height and bulk relationship, like, uh, you know, the overall form and mass of the building. S in. Uh, what is the building clad in? Is it brick? You know, is it is it wood siding? Uh, what is it, and how does it fit into the context locally? And is it even if it's a modern material, does it work today? Kind of like masonite siding or hardy board. Sometimes that's a good substitute material, but again, it depends on what your your um, uh, design guidelines allow. And then holes. Uh, that's windows and doors, how that looks, the height of the sills and the, and the heads, and kind of that rhythm and repetition that you have going down the street. This is a, a, just a, a document I had on file and I wanted to put the cover up because there's lots of good information on infill. And I think really if you just Google Main Street infill construction, you're going to end up with a nice array of things from all over the country, and I, and I have, but this is just one of those examples from the National Trust. So I want to move ahead and to just some things that maybe again are you going to try to I'm going to try to open your mind a little bit further than just thinking about infill as buildings. Obviously, they're kind of the, the cornerstone piece, um, just like all of our Main Street buildings are the cornerstone to the down. We, I lost your audio, Larry. That, that we hope for in Main Street. Uh, one quick example. So, you know, we had these neighborhoods historically surrounding uh, the historic district. And in this case, this is a, these are called pocket neighborhoods. 
there, there was an architect uh, that wrote a book called Pocket Neighbors, and this is his uh, specialty. His name is Ross Chapin, D-H-A-P-I-N. He's from the Northwest, and he's developed this, this context of cottage, little, little small cottages that kind of are around a, a shared space. And I think as we become a little bit more urban, even in our small towns, and we want, and people, especially baby boomers and millennials are wanting these smaller spaces and they still want to be connected. We need to think about this missing middle housing. Uh, that's a term that planners like to use and I'm just picking up on it, but it's the stuff between kind of the single family home and the one or two bedroom apartment. It's the thing that fits people and their families that want to have a little bit more active and connected lifestyle. And also just kind of lets people stay in their homes longer potentially. In this, in this model, there's a little center community house and, and a center common green that everyone has access to. And there's also shared parking. But if you notice from the site plan above the Google map, it's about the size of a city block. And then look next to the left of it, there's like three, there could be potentially four houses at this, at the way it was zoned originally. So that's a pretty interesting and compelling way to think about infill. So if you have a, a blank lot, you could maybe put four of these um, a couple blocks off Main Street or something like that. And it could really add a lot of value and some community to people who are really seeking it. Another thing we can do is we can start using the basements again. And this is a picture of uh, I think the Lake City on the top left. And um, they are in the process and we're going to be going out to do a charrette with them soon uh, with CPI, um, which CPI is actually doing a downtown underground initiative to really expose these spaces like the one on the bottom left in Florence, Colorado, these original commercial spaces that were down underneath the sidewalk and you would go down into these. And, and when you see something, some one of these, you need to stop and look at it and see if they're using it that one in Florence is going to be reused. It's pretty cool. Um, the art cave in Lake City is going to be reused. They've been working hard to clean it out. I think that's very encouraging to think about using these spaces again in buildings where we already have the space. Um, and just you're doing good preservation work by maintaining them. And also you're creating a use that you wouldn't have anywhere else. And I think that's really special. I like the picture of the guy hanging out of his little uh, uh, barista window on just, you know, he has has a small uh, window service there and you don't see that much, but that's a cool use. You also don't see it when people reuse a billboard for a swing set, but I mean, who knows, the sky's the limit, right? Also, the, the clothing um, rack on the side of this uh, Goodwill store, it says free, which is pretty neat. You know, it, it really depends on what the mix is and where you are and what your needs are for your community. But learning how to serve your community uh, in a creative way through infill, providing amenities that they need, whether or not that's a drinking fountain, a Connect Four or a new jacket. That's really something that, that you can have a positive impact with. Um, I think this is in Windsor, or maybe this is in uh, Gail, Gail would know where the shipping container is. That's in Fort Collins, okay. Um, some prefabricated, those are not cheap, I can tell you right now, um, but they're pretty cool. And it, I think if you built several of them, it would be a little cheaper per square foot. Um, but they're also not necessarily permanent. You can pick them up and move them. So the idea of temporary is something important to think about when you're thinking about infill, because you may want to be tactical with your approach towards um, uh, restoring use to a lot to see if something works or to provide a business a quick startup opportunity so that they could move into a, a vacant uh, space that, that you know your downtown development association is, is is revitalizing for a new business. I mean, there's, there can be a strategic approach to getting things um, to doing infill. Um, the one on the bottom left is a solar powered kiosk, which I thought was pretty neat. I found that online. 
So really, there's a lot of different ideas. And really, I would not put anything past you guys because the things that I see out in the communities, uh, it's always surprising. It always makes me smile. Um, just a confession, this was my first full presentation to put together with Colorado Main Street program. I've been out in the communities a lot since I started six months ago. So you can expect to have more PowerPoints and pictures in the future, but uh, I want to see your examples when I'm out there and I want to visit. And um, if you're not a Main Street program, uh, let us know if, if we can uh, help you with any outreach or come in and see your community and talk with anyone about the program. And we'd like to do that. And with that, I guess I just uh, would ask if there's any we, questions. Yep, we have another question that came in from Darlene Jensen uh, in Woodland Park. And she states, is Woodland Park is not able to be eligible as a nationally designated historic district per the Woodland Park's planning director for two reasons. One is um, enabling legislation for landmark designation does not include historic districts. And the other one is Woodland Park does not have the density or concentration of historic resources that would qualify them for national historic district designation. So that being said, she wonders if there are local controls that can be put in place that can help save historic buildings that have recently been subject to destruction? That's a great question, Darlene. And yes, there, there are. I would, I would say, and I don't, and I apologize, I don't know if, if they're a CLG community, um, but the CLG program can essentially yes, do they that. Are. Yep. Okay, that, that's a great first step um, to have access to that. Number one, it bolsters your preservation ethic through. Um, you know, forming a commission. Now, whether or not the commission is actually active and whether or not you have design guidelines that are being implemented and policed by the city to some degree, um, those are really kind of the, the, the parts that get tough is actually having the capacity to do that sometimes. And you can locally designate um, uh, a district as the historic district, which you know essentially could be the Main Street District or however you would choose to do that, or you could have multiple district boundaries in smaller areas. Um, but you could locally designate the building. And then also you could have the building, um, uh, the buildings listed on the state register, which is something that um, is, is not really, as many of you guys know that, you know, a building listed on the national or state register is not going to protect it from somebody buying it and spray painting it with pink spray paint. I mean, it's that just delists the building and, you know, they could tear it down. There's really nothing that there's nothing that really protects it unless they've taken enough money from the state historic fund that it goes into uh, a state of, uh, uh, of a long term uh, easement where they have to maintain the property under certain conditions of receiving the money. Um, you know, in lieu of doing all that, and which is not possible for every property, and like Darlene's saying, to really get getting your entire district listed on, as with the, as a national uh, historic district is is not. It, it just may not be a, a possibility unless the state gets behind that uh, nomination. Um, there may be a way to be creative with the boundaries to the district so that it does have a certain level of capacity. I don't know if it's over 50% historic structures or what. Um, so we might look at that, Darlene, and see if there is a way to be creative. Um, but I really think the best way to start protecting buildings is starting at the local level and really implementing um, some sound and simple design guidelines and having a commission that is educated on the Secretary of the Interior Standards and also um, the basics of good design in your community as it was done many years ago and then how to carry forward those same traditions today using the same using modern materials and you know so once you got that group which is really the the diamond diamond in the rough defined sometimes but they're there and 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 we can actually come to your town and and 
And uh, I know Mark Rodman with History Colorado, who's over the CLG program currently, he has trainings available too to help with um, establishing that ethic. But um, in terms of working with design, working with um, your commissioners, working with um, people that, that are actually regulating preservation, that's something that I'd be glad to talk with any of you guys on a case-by-case -case basis and see what the needs are. And then, like I said, if we can't provide a training, a solution, or some kind of resource that we even have on file or have created, then um, we can get you to someone who can. I have another question for you, Larry. We've got a couple of minutes left, and this is uh, from Darlene as well. She's asking uh, if the Main Street boundary gives some control for historic preser for historic preservation of buildings within the Main Street boundary. Well, yeah, that's essentially how you would establish. Um, so the idea of you have a you have a Main Street boundary. If you're a Main Street program, we ask you to establish a boundary and show us where that is for reporting purposes for reinvestment and. Uh, uh, building uh, rehabs and facades, you know, all the things that, that we track, having that boundary is number one. And I just say, just by proxy, make it your historic district boundary, unless there's a reason to include other things in that or additional sub areas. That's just a good way to start because that way you can shift it. Um, and just through language in your ordinance, you could, you could um, say if the boundary of Main Street changes, then and also the historic, historic district boundary changes because they're one and the same. And then through that, what you do is you form a zone overlay. And so you would, that's when you say, here is our historic preservation ordinance. And it is applicable to the Main Street district boundary. And that way, that historic district, that, that historic preservation ordinance that you've established, which is a good part about being a CLG community is, is you have to do that. Um, you implement it for that area and any other area that you choose to. But I think it's very important to keep that separate in the language that that's what it what it's for. And then that would be the area that you would have a, a commission of, of citizens and townspeople that would meet um, that do have training and understanding and care about historic properties and kind of get it, you know, kind of get the Main Street way, too. And um, which certainly should have somebody from Main Street on your HPC. Those folks are the ones that decide whether or not when a developer comes to town and wants to build a new property, if that's going to be, if it's going to be fall within your infill design guidelines for the historic district. Um, and that keeping up appearances document is just super simple and actually would work just would work a lot better than not having anything uh, for infill design, particularly. That's a great just little thing to adopt or to uh, photocopy into your uh existing ordinance so yes you can protect the district as a whole through the local ordinance and actually that is the best way to protect the district like i said if you're a national national uh, register district there's nothing that's that that doesn't protect you from from changes that private property owners want to make there's no way to there's no policing there the only policing happens at the local level but again that's where it takes some manpower and a little bit of uh, uh, grit to, to kind of set, you know, set the line and then follow it. Well, there's no more questions, Larry, that have come in. Um, if you want to close, it's 101. You're right on time. Okay, guys, I'm we apologize. I'm uh, sorry about the, the mix up at the beginning and getting a little bit behind. Uh, I hope that you didn't miss anything. Um, our contact information, this is the Main Street team right here on the screen. There's only three of us, and um, but we're pretty mobile, and, and we uh, would love to come see your community. We'd love to help you in any way we can. If you do have any follow-up questions, just please shoot me an email. It's just larry.lucas at state.co.us, um, and I, I, I would love to go into depth further um, on this idea of infill. I hope you guys have enjoyed taking a broader view of what infill may potentially be. Um, I'd also love to hear any criticism and, and any ideas that you have about making this presentation better. Um, 
I really appreciate everyone's time and I thank you for attending today. Hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you.